Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. Ahead of the Kildalton College 50th anniversary celebrations, we took the opportunity to talk to staff from the dairy herd past and present about the evolution of the dairy herd in that time. How milk quota, land availability, research and the college function for student learning impacted on management of the dairy herd. On this special episode, we hear from James Ryan and Zerlina Pratt about the present day, John Connolly about the 80s through to the noughties. But first, Norman Story tells us about the early days of dairy in the 1970s. Yeah, well, the herd was um, there when the college opened in 1971. There was about, I think, around 40 cows in the herd. Uh, I joined in 73, and I think it was 75, 76 when the brucellosis uh, outbreak occurred. And obviously, it destocked all the cows. So we had to start building up again. We had heifers, obviously, that from previous years, you know. And um, so we decided that we'd try and um, improve the genetic base a little bit. So we went out down to the Cork area and bought some calves from some of the well-known um, dairy herds at the time and and talk through um the breed at the time norman what was the cow type and was it the normal uh cow type of the area or nationally well they were all british friesians uh when i came to Kildalton, there were only the british friesians at that stage there was no holsteins or holstein crosses um it was the, the british friesians and we worked closely with the british friesian society as well so uh, the herds we went down to did have records, you know, so um, that was a factor. We obviously didn't get the best heft for calves from them, but we, we got some nice ones, you know. Your time spent with the dairy herd in Kildalton was in that pre-quota era. You know, were there limitations around production or what did the environment look like at that time? No, it was production, production and more production orientated. You know, there were no quotas. There was no restrictions in any shape or fashion. The, I suppose the environment didn't really matter. It was removing fences, removing ditches and putting up electric fences and dividing the paddocks all into that, you know, but there was no restriction on production at all. It was getting the national yield up. That was the, 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 the big thing. And individual yield of the cows within the herd, you know, I, I know the, the currency was gallons at the time, but what did you see as the normal production um, of, of cows at, um, in the 70s? Well, I think if I remember right, the, the national average was six or around 600 gallons, you know, and we were well on that, maybe 700 gallons as far as I remember, you know, and uh, just to keep we were following all the uh, advice from Moor Park and such like places and um, trying to just get the yield up through through better breeding and better management, and better grassland, you know. And, 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 and on grassland, Norman, what did that look like? I know that, say, when we think about it now, we're aimed to be out in early February and we're out, you know, hopefully until mid-November or even later. When did cows get out to grass in your time with the Kildalton herd? Well, we always aimed to get out in early to mid-March. That was the plan. And the season finished around mid-November. We wouldn't have been as early as um, further south in the Cork area, but we were obviously a lot better than further north. So uh, that was the aim at that stage. The grassland was laid out well in paddocks and they were all close to the dairy unit. So cows certainly didn't have to go very far, you know. We... I, Again, I'm guessing a little bit that um, we had 12 or 13 paddocks. Some were one day and some were two day paddocks. It's just how they fitted into the what were, were the various fields at the time, you know. You know, when we look at the present day, there's a significant amount of technology in parlours now, you know, cluster removers, which prevents over and under milking of cows. But in, in your time working with students uh, on the dairy unit, was there an impact of, I guess, you know, a, um, a non-consistent milker with students in and out of the parlour on the performance of the cows? Yes, I think, there, I think there had to be. And we estimated 
when the students weren't there in holiday time. Now, students were there all term time and weekends during term time, but then they were gone for holiday times. Uh, and we estimated with the regular dairyman that yields improved by about 15, 16, 17% when he was milking on his own. So you bear in mind that students were coming from very different backgrounds. Some students were coming from top dairy herds and some students were coming from no dairy farming at all at all. But yet they had to do their week uh, on milking cows. So it had to have an effect. And also maybe, you know, rightly or wrongly, students might have been in a bit of a hurry some evenings or certainly at weekends, you know, so cows may not have been milked always properly. So that had to have an effect. And we estimated, as I say, around 15, 16, 17 percent that is affected them by. And now John Connolly remembering Kildalton Dairy in the 1980s. Yeah, well, in 1980, um, there was a new 16 unit parlour put up there. We come from an old 60 unit parlour in the building that was then known as the 1944 building. And that building was put up by the Oblet Fathers. Um, the cow numbers would have been low, I'd say, around 30 or 40, I'm not quite sure. It was an unusual building, the 1944 building, because um, milk and parlours wouldn't have been very common then. And there was a huge ramp up into the parlour. They didn't, the, the Oblets didn't sink the pit at all. The cows had to sort of, had a steep climb upwards uh, to be milked. And we progressed from there then to 1980 to 16 unit parlour and um, cow numbers were low and um, you're talking anywhere around between 40, 50 cows at that stage into the new 16 unit. And um, we progressed from there then to 2007 to the existing new parlour and um, that's with all the bells and whistles, that milk recording, um, cluster removers, meal feeding, all that sort of stuff. And that cost in 2007 around 800,000 at that stage. The, the cow, the type of cow, when I started working in Kildalton, the, um, somewhere around 1981, the, was, there was again around 50 cows milking. And it was really tailored to the amount of land that we had in the college for cows. Um, a lot of other enterprises were pulling for land. So we had to match the number of cows to the amount of land we had. And most of the cows when I started there were pedigree British Frisian. And um, we had a cert for each cow and each, each heifer calf had to be drawn and submitted and registered. Now the bull calves, we just, um, we reared them, we didn't, we castrated them. And they went into the two-year-old beef system in the college. So we didn't, we didn't breed bulls. We, we just, that was very time consuming. And then as the years progressed, um, from, from 1980 onwards, we'll say to nine, uh, 1990 or so, some British, some Holstein Frisians were introduced to try to lift the, the um, milk yield in the college. Um, it was at a sort of a flash rate. And uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2001 then, that was a problem all over the country. Uh, there was a lot of Holstein Frisians within herds and Fertility, infertility was very, very high. And in some cases, not, not Kildalton, now, infertility could be as high as 20%. So Moore Park introduced the Norwegian red cow, um, purebred cows, imported them in and dispersed them around different herds in the country. So we got some in Kildalton. And the idea there was to improve fertility and um, but that you could cross them, you could get them served to a Frisian or a Holstein, and you'd still you'd still be okay as regards milk yield, but the fertility would be much improved. And that that actually turned out to be the case. The, the fertility improved immensely, and that's before we started talking about half breads. And um, so um, back in around two thousand and four or five, um, we started making limousine cows of all things uh, with the, with the Frisians we introduced some limousines and they would have come true from the suckler herd there would be limousine cross Frisians um, their milk yield was around 600 gallons and the idea was to increase cow numbers um, but they, that only lasted for a few years um, 
because with good grass and meal and that, the limousine care was putting on a lot of body condition and, and the milk yield obviously went back. The yield for the cows in general was around 700 gallons, 800 gallons, those were for the, for the Frisian cow. And um, they were with a butter fat there of about 3.5 and a protein around 3%. Um, now, as, as well as that, then around 1982, we, the big thing was to put sheep behind cows to, to mop up, to eat the dung pads and that, but the grass around the dung pads. Um, and we did that in Kildalton. We spent a good few bob uh, fencing for sheep in the dairy paddocks. And we tried that there for a year or two. But the problem with the, the sheep behind the cows is that they were e eating the grass as the grass was regrowing. So in the if you're on a 21 day rotation, which we were at that stage, by the time you came around to the paddock again, there was very little grass there. So that only stayed in vogue for about two years or so. You talk about the introduction of the Norwegian raid um, as a means of lifting fertility. And you had pointed to some farms in the country where you had infertility levels of 20 percent and probably even in excess of that. So where were um, empty rates uh, on the Kildalton farm? Empty rates on the Kildalton farm are somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. And I suppose that like we were doing um, you know, pre-service detect heat detection. We're using tail paint in Kildalton for, for as long as I can remember. And uh, we didn't introduce teaser bulls until later. So and we're using AI. So we're always very alert as, as regards watching cows coming on heat. Um, so I could say we were probably one of the first farms around to do a tail paint. So with that sort of effect, then our fertility, infertility wasn't too high, I suppose, at the time, you know. We were aware of it and we were just on the ball, I suppose, you know. And and also the, the really interesting, and I, I, I've never heard before bringing the limousine uh, crossing with the Frisian, um, you know, as a potential dairy cow. Was that a common thing at the time or was it just something that you trialed yourselves? It wasn't at all common, but um, our regional director at the time, um, he was of the opinion that we should give it a try, like just to increase cow numbers very rapidly. Um, we we're, were around at 50 cows or so, and we had we had a lot of uh, sort of uh, limousine cross cows that came out of the dairy herd. So it was really his idea that we should try that for for a while, you know. And was that something got to do with increasing cow numbers within a herd, but being conscious of uh, production limitations with quota? Absolutely, yeah. I suppose the, yeah, the quota probably came into it as well. I'd say at that stage, you know, because the college, the college were, we were tipping on 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 the on the top of the quota every every year, and even went over the small bit. But we started feeding a lot of milk to, to uh, newborn calves, and we also remember one or two years feeding whole milk to weanlings. The weanling house had a an ideal trough for feeding milk. It was sort of built in as part of the shed, you know. So I remember bringing milk up there after milking and into the weanlands there just to keep the keep it in the quota and with quota like you know you would have worked with the Kildalton herd for the entirety of milk quota you know was it a huge limit limiting factor and was I suppose the progress within the dairy herd at Kildalton stagnated as a result it probably was but um I'd say Probably what was equally pulling there was the availability of land, you know. And you see there's so many different land-based enterprises in Kildalton. There was at that time, and there still is, that we're all tying for land, you know. And we're depending on, on leased land from, from neighbours and that. And even that was difficult to get because Kildalton, we were always competing for land with the likes of Iberic, Iberic Produce and that, you know. And then on to production, John, like you, you talk seven to eight hundred gallons of milk and I've converted that to new money and that would be in and around 3,200 to, to 3,600 litres of milk. Was that reflective of production at the time? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it was. That's why that's why we moved away and farmers moved away from, you know, into the Holstein region, I suppose, to improve milk yields, you know. And finally, 
I spoke to James Ryan and Zerlina Pratt about the last decade and the future of the college herd. And James first explained the expansion of the herd in line with technical efficiencies. The cow numbers kind of radically increased from maybe before my time. I took over in kind of the late not 2000s and around 2008, we went from probably around the 70 cow number to about 110, 120 pushing on. And while land was still the limiting factor, the way we got around the increased numbers was actually to increase uh, stocking rate. We were traditionally well running probably um, in the early noughties at around maybe 2.2, 2.3 livestock units per hectare. And we pushed that up as close as possible up to within nitrates to 2.8, 2.9, that kind of range. And that was that was uh, how we increased cow numbers while land was still the limiting factor. Looking at cow type then, cow type uh, was traditionally your pedigree Holstein herd that was in Kildarton kind of in the 90s and the early noughties. And I haven't spent maybe a year in New Zealand uh, after I graduated, uh, decided that I'd like to go down this road. And so kind of with, with college management decided that we would cross the whole herd. Initially, we crossed the herd with Norwegian Red because fertility was an issue or calving interval at that stage was pushing out to maybe closer to 380, 400 days. And there's research coming from Moorpark at that time said that crossbreeding with the Norwegian Red. At that stage as well, the whole industry had kind of went from a flat payment on litres of milk to the to the where it is now to the A plus B minus C payment system. And that kind of got us moving into the Jersey. And Jersey then uh, became cross breeding became the kind of the primary breeding strategy and her kind of well into 2010, 2011, 2013, all that kind of up to maybe when Lizardina took over the her then uh, probably in late 2018, 19. So that's kind of where we were with the herd in that period, Emma. And, and James, on that, um, like we would have heard from John, um, you know, in the up until the 90s, you're looking at, uh, you know, a milk yield in and around three and a half thousand litres, uh, fat of three and a half, protein of 3.0. You know, those decisions that you made in terms of breeding with the, the Norwegian Red Cross into the Jersey Cross, what implications did that have for production on the farm? Look, production increased substantially over over this period and kind of we were driven by the whole thinking at that stage of uh, 1250 kilos of milk solids per hectare so we had uh, our, our herd went from um you know what john uh, stated already to 3500 liters up to uh, 5000 liters in that period and instead of uh, kind of we we stopped using the liters terminology per cow at that stage and we started using milk solids per cow and we were pushing as close as possible to you know 450 460 kilos of milk solids at the stock rate that have already said of say 2.8 2.9 which is pushing as close to the 15 uh, 1250 50 kilos of milk solids per hectare. So that's kind of where the, the milk went. But uh, all in that period, milk increased substantially per cow and milk solids per cow also and per hectare also increased. Th- this idea of, um, you know, you talk about the radical increase in cow numbers and, you know, as was driven by stocking rate. Was that, um, I suppose, to complement the signals coming that, you know, we were moving out of this quota era or, you know, what was the thinking around that? Yeah, I, I think it was twofold, um, Emma Louise. It was definitely um, kind of preparing for post quota in 2015 and being ready. But also at that stage, we were always locked into this uh, this land uh, a certain amount of land that we had in Kildarton and suddenly even courses went from Kildarton in 2015 land became our quota so land became our limiting factor so in order to increase production we actually had to increase milk solids per cow and by doing that the cows kind of steadied to 450 uh, 460 kilos of milk solids the only way then we start looking was output per hectare 
and we start increasing the stocking rate. Albeit we had to keep in under the nitrous derogation of uh, in we we were in the high de, uh, high derogation at that stage, and we pushed it up to uh, two point nine, which is what was allowed allowed. And to you, Zerlina, uh, James has signalled things have changed over the last maybe four or five years in terms of the breeding strategy. Um, you know, up to that point, there was a significant level of crossbreeding on the farm. Where have you taken things since? We kind of, we were always pushing EBI uh, genetics at all times. And I suppose by that stage, I was looking at top EBI bulls um, and just looking at changing the strategy. Like up to then, we had bred all of our cows to dairy AI. And that was the protocol for our breeding strategy. So from 2019, I decided to bring in some beef AI and start um, supplying, I suppose, because we have different enterprises on the farm, it lent itself that some of the, the cows that we breed, now we breed them to, to beef AI, and some of those are actually used as replacement heifers going into the suckler herd here. So it, it kind of lends itself um, to, to being used for that. So I started to kind of incorporate a little bit more beef AI. And from 2019, I suppose, I, I picked out those cows that were lower EBI and through team meetings and, and things during that year, we decided that any low EBI cows, we would actually transition away from serving them with dairy AI from the start. And we'd, we'd actually start using beef AI from the very start of breeding season. So this year it's changed again. Uh, we're, we're using sex semen on our, our heifers uh, this year for the first time. We're selecting out 60 cows um, for dairy AI and they're only getting one round of dairy AI. And all our low EBI cows and any cows that come for a first repeat will now be bred to beef AI. So it's a big transition, I suppose, from using all dairy AI, you know, only a couple of years ago. And, there, you know, there's merits to that, too, like that we have better quality calves to, to some extent. And because we have that Jersey breeding in the herd and um, that we want to, I suppose, limit the amount of lower quality uh, Jersey bull cows coming from the herds. That was our, our kind of our idea. And, and the second, I suppose, part of it too is, is that we don't use a bull. We don't use a stock bull and we haven't used a stock bull here in the last two years with the cows or with the heifers. It's all AI, a 10 week breeding program of all AI with, with all our, our heifers and cows. James has mentioned that, you know, focusing on, um, you know, st- pushing stocking rate. And I suppose that can only occur um, with increased grass production or improved utilization, or I suppose alternatively, you're feeding a high level of supplement. Um, how has grassland performance um, evolved in the last decade at Kildalton? Well, I suppose from the time even from when I came in here with um, working with James, we would do from about 2018, there were about 35 grass walks done here in a year, which was um, was very good up, up to then. We've actually pushed that up now to about 65 grass walks in a year. So grass management is absolutely priority for us on the farm as well. But we would have gone from about 10 tons of grass grown in about 2000s. 16 up to 14.2 tons grown last year uh, and that's with a reduction in protected nitrogen being used on the farm as well so i suppose we've incorporated clover in the last number of years as well we're we're over sowing with clover early in spring and we're also reseeding um with clover species in the sward as well and just you know more kind of a closer look at management on the farm as well more grazings per paddock so we've we've come up from about five and a half grazings per paddock up to just under eight grazings last year so all of that i think is has really helped getting cows into the right covers um, and we just have taken a, a closer look at at really managing the system as much as we can with that reduction in fertilizer at the same time which is important too so that has all lent itself to being able to afford having that kind of stock number of, of cows on the milking platform. And, and James, another point then in terms of animal health, you have been hit with some challenges from an animal health perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about the incidence of microplasma bovis on the farm? Yes, I mean, in 2013, kind of 
maybe March, April 2013, we noticed that our cows were, weren't kind of picking up after calving and getting going in and peaking in the lactation. And uh, it, this microplasma buzz, as it eventually was diagnosed as microplasma buzz, it took us the best part of uh, six weeks to two months just to diagnose this. It's just quite difficult to diagnose. So what we noticed initially was cows coughing and then uh, uh, kind of a jump in stomatic cell count. And that was, that was kind of unusual. And then cow was presenting with swollen joints. And after numerous um, kind of swabs and analysis with, by the department vets, microplasma bovis was uh, diagnosed. And look, it, it's, it's a disease that is very, very poor cure rate currently. And in 2013, we actually lost 20 cows out of the herd with microplasma bovis. bovis. They actually had to be sent for slaughter in the end because it was we just could not get on top of it, and uh, in the end we just we just uh, took the humane um, option and just uh, sent the cows to be slaughtered. But again, it was it was a difficult time. It was a time when we were looking at maybe a herd of 110, 120 cows. So you're looking at maybe 18, 20 percent of your herd just being wiped out. And at the time, I spoke to an awful lot of uh, farmers that had got this. And the, the kind of the thing that they were all saying was, look, you just have to hit, take the hit on this. And it is a big hit. It's it's basically 20% of your hair just wiped out in the space of six weeks to two months. And it was one of the, um, probably the, just the, the parts of the, the my time in the in the role in Kildot and that I I, uh, I found difficult and so did uh, probably acknowledge the work that Anthony Sweeney, our herdsman at the time, had to deal with as well. He was the one facing this every morning and every evening, and there was a bit of a knock on effect on cows in the subsequent breeding season. Then, so not not a nice time. Whereas um, I wouldn't wish it on any other farmer to get that that uh, microplasma bovis within the herd. And James, were there any cows that recovered or, you know, was it a situation where any of them that had it had to go for slaughter? Yeah, absolutely. 20 of the herd went for slaughter. Um, we we probably had another five to seven or eight cows that recovered, but they were caught in time. Probably initially when the, the initial uh, hit uh, took over. Uh, we we didn't we didn't know what was happening. We kept treating. We were treating kind of the vets at the time were just treating for this uh, tylosol, which is a, a treatment for high stomatic cell count in cows. And I think that's still recommended as a treatment, but it's it's very early diagnosis important. So the ones that were diagnosed early, maybe uh, five to seven cows were were cured, uh, but we did lose uh, the best part of twenty percent of our herd, which had to be slaughtered due to it. And it's interesting that. You talk about eighteen to twenty percent of the herd. I mean, that's your your standard replacement rate. So, like, I mean, you know, in reality, you're looking at at double for that year. Uh, it, it affected the the replacement rate, which is a knock on effect, and it took us maybe the best part of three to four years just to get back replacement rate back to the standard twenty percent. Because if that, effectively that year we were looking at a replacement rate of forty percent just to to get the herd back to where it should be, and that took the best part of three or four years just to get us back to what now we consider normal at 18 to 20 percent replacement rate what are the impacts as you see it you know working say on the on the farm interacting with students what is the impact of student input and and student learning on the performance of the dairy herd i think it's paramount and i i say to students when they come into the college it's a teaching college um it's a working farm and uh, nothing's perfect uh, sometimes i think students come in with that perception that you know everything's absolutely perfect because it's a you know it's a college farm but i think it's really important for students and they they do have great involvement outside on the farm helping you know like james said anthony sweeney is, is very much heavily involved with the herdsman here um, and he does a lot of the work with the cows and for students to come in here it is a teaching college it doesn't always go right every single day um, but they're there to learn so you know we'd have students in they'll be feeding calves They'll be mixing up milk replacer. They'll be in the parlor. They may never have milked before and they're learning how to milk cows. And, you know, there's there's loads of different elements and um, teaching them what paddocks we put cows into, why we're putting them into those paddocks. I don't think in terms of herd performance and farm performance, it has impacted uh, to a, a major extent because students are given 
a lot of time and a lot of guidance on you know best practice and and how we should do different tasks and different skills with the cows and on the farm um but at the end of the day if you know there is something that happens in the parlor or there's a high somatic cell count and a student puts on a cluster on stack cow and it you know it it goes into the bulk tank or whatever the case might be or the the milk replacer isn't mixed right you know because the student doesn't have much experience or is, is learning how to to do that skill that's the that's the point of the college it is a training college at the end of the day and um, but they're given an awful lot of guidance and an awful lot of of help when they are on the farm to be able to to learn those skills in kind of 2010, we kind of split the herd in two and we had, we started the second year dairy course in 2009 and we looked at the whole area of um, increasing uh, the, the production from the cow, which was kind of at that period where we we're looking at increasing production. So we took 30 cows, gave the second year students the management of those 30 cows and we called that the 1250 herd where the cow, the students uh, were involved in all aspects of management, milking the cows before the main herd and before the main herd in the morning, in the evening as well. Uh, looking at the breeding strategies for that herd, looking at increasing the milk solids from that herd through, um, through breeding, obviously, but then looking at feeding type as well. And uh, we, we, we ran that herd for five years and the students had access to that herd and made all decisions on it, that herd. So that was a big learning pro, a big learning curve for those students um, in second year where they, they had kind of all, as, as Arlene outlined, all the skills built up in first year. And then we kind of gave them access to that herd and let them run that herd for the, their period in Kildotten. It's a very interesting one because, um, you know, I suppose the traditional learning in the classroom, it's its all well and good, but it has its limitations. And the fact that I suppose the students get out in the afternoons, they have access to the stock and the, the parlor and you know the general facilities. I suppose it, it, it creates a real connection in your brain as to this is the theory and this is the practical. Just it's interesting to see that those kind of five or six groups that experienced that, uh, that herd where they had managed them from, it's amazing that they have either went on to the level seven farm management course and done been quite successful and are now um, involved in running herds out there. But if went home and expanded as well because they see how they could expand with the 30 cows on their own herd or in the college herd and it gave them that confidence and it gave them that kind of the skill to be able to to increase her to take all those skills home either to their home farm or to their their management roles within farms as well. So what is the future for the Kildalton herd? We might start with you, James. I think the future is going to be quite a similar size herd, uh, very well um, ran, very well managed, uh, kind of meeting all the, the key performance indicators that Chagas uh, bring out and uh, particularly around the breeding, looking at where we're going at the moment with the whole area of minimising AI usage, just getting enough replacements and making sure we have our bull calf at the end of the day as a sale product. Um, I also see as our kind of role in sustainability, uh, biodiversity is becoming important as well. So the planting of hedgerows, the incorporation of clover, the whole area of um, energy management, uh, rainwater harvesting, and maybe a certain extent solar panels. And uh, I think that that's that's where I see the, the herd going. That's where I see the unit going. i uh, been very much involved in the drive for sustainability, sustainable dairy and uh, incorporating all the, the KPIs, particularly around um, the, the new legislation coming down in greenhouse, greenhouse gases. And to use Erlina. Yeah, I suppose just to build on, on what James has said, I think the herds, in terms of herd size, we will stay fairly level at what we are. We're, we're at a stock rate of 2.63 on the milking block here at the moment. Um, so we'll stay fairly similar going forward. Um, but as well as that, I think it's it's just an element of progressing from where we are. And look, we do an awful lot of measurements of everything on the farm and it's to, to build on that every single year. And certainly with students coming in here to the college, it's to implement the research, you know, that's been proven on the ground um, in different research centres um, and to actually implement that on the ground. So, you know, everything from the, the less of, of your nitrogen usage, um, clover incorporation, pushing production in terms of grass production and and forage production while maintaining stocking rate those kind of things with a student focus at the end of the day so making sure the students are heavily involved in 
in the progress that's going on in the farm here. So I think that's going to be very important and having sustainability at the epicentre of that as well. And the last word to you, James, um, the dairy herd will be on display at the Kildalton 50 celebration on the 25th of June. Can you tell us briefly a little bit more about the event? Kildalton is celebrating 50 years on the 25th of June. Kildalton um, is now the largest agricultural colleges within the suite of agricultural colleges within Chagas. Um, it is it is a college that annually has 1,400 students coming through its doors, and we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate our achievements over the last 50 years. So in order to do that, we're running um, kind of a, an open day or a, a day of celebration on the 25th of June. Everyone is welcome. We particularly invite past students, students that maybe were around in the late 70s or 80s going into the 90s, that uh, kind of have... Um, have built up a kind of a relationship with Kildalton and see Kildalton as their initial step into agricultural education. And we invite all those people there. Everything will be on display on the day. We're particularly interested in showing off our decade rooms. Our decade rooms are rooms um, that look at what activities that went on in the college over the last uh, 50 years. So we'll have a decade room on the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and 2010. Each room will be dedicated to a decade. We We'll also have um, the whole farm is open. It's uh, it's available to view how things have changed. We will have the vintage tractors right up to the modern day tractors. On dairy, we'll be displaying, as Serena has said, all our technologies, particularly our EBI cows, um, our high EBI cows, our cows that are in the bottom of uh, in terms of EBI. We'll be looking at our replacements and our calves. Uh, we will have sheep there. Uh, our sheep unit will be displayed. And uh, particularly uh, also our, our suckler unit, uh, we look at, uh, we have a very high genetic merit suckler unit that will be on display. We'll be looking at the whole area of biodiversity and the signpost farm initiatives. They will be on display. We have incorporated hedgerows into Kildalton and they will be all on display. We'll be looking at the whole area of our farm structures, um, <clears throat> the whole area of water management, truck, water truck management, uh, of fencing. And then if you go down to the horticulture unit, all our uh, impressive horticulture units will be on display. And uh, in uh, in terms of the equine side of things, we will have the Army Equitation School there who will be given, um, there'll be um, sessions on side saddling, sessions on show jumping, sessions on eventing, and uh, these will all be on display. We'll also have, uh, we hope to have one of the local radio stations there, which will be broadcasting from the from the day itself. And look, it's, 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 it's a day for everyone to enjoy, but particularly appealing to past students, students that have a relationship with us, that kind of feel Kildotum was their first step into farming. And we'd love to see you all back on the day. So we'd lo- lo- like to see you all back on the 25th of June. It sounds like a jam-packed day, James. Really looking forward to it. Thank you, James. And thank you, Zerlina. Thanks, Anna. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Norman Story, John Connolly, Zerlina Pratt and James Ryan for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.